I'm really excited to be back. Um, I was just here last week. We had a really great um, talk with Melanie from Salem on the Edge about galleries. Um, Kathy reached out to me because I'm the director of Blackfish and asked me to give that talk. And I was excited to hear about the series and she started talking about this particular one. I was like, ooh, I want to do that one too. <laughs> so thanks for having me back because this is actually my most favorite thing to talk about. Um, so I've been at Blackfish Gallery for about two years now, um, and one of the things that has kind of evolved at my short time there is just so many artists that are coming in wanting to um, be represented. Um, and we're a membership gallery, so there is we're a cooperative gallery, it's not really for everyone. Um, and also we have limited room in the gallery, so uh, it's hard to turn people away. <laughs> Um, whether they apply and they don't make it in or just it's just not a fit for them. And, um, I really love working with artists. I'm a creative business strategist. I do coaching. And so it's kind of uh, grown my interest in working with artists one-on-one -on -one to really help them promote themselves. Because I think now more than ever, it's such an exciting time to be an artist. You're so lucky to be alive in this time with the internet and all the resources we have. And I think as long as um, net neutrality is still a thing, <laughs> it's pretty relatively low um, cost when you consider ha having a business or being an artist and being in business as an entrepreneur. Um, so it's really exciting. Uh, all the tools that are out there. Um, I think about Andy Warhol and how excited he would be. Um, how, um, his dream has come true. You know, everyone can have their own channel, they can put themselves out there. It's so exciting. So um, that's what I really want to talk to you today about are all the ways that you can um, promote yourself. Because I think that is a scary thing for artists to do, right? You're mostly in your studio, in the zone, doing your thing, making your work. That's great. And I think there's uh, this myth that somehow, some way, you'll just get discovered. You know, that, that, that's the way it happens. You know, that people just get discovered. And it, it really didn't happen that way in the past either. Uh, most of the most successful artists were people who really just put themselves out there. And um, as I was saying, you know, it's kind of an exciting time to be alive and be an artist because more than ever, it's just easy for you to have your own platform and put yourself out there and share that. So um, that's what we're going to talk about today, all the things to do. And, but what I'd like to talk about before I get into all, because this happens a lot, is that people come to me and are like, what are the things that I need to do, or this and that? And I think the, the very first thing, before you even think about technology, or press releases, or social media, all the things, is really you. Who are you and what is your voice? Because that's the thing that's really going to be the most powerful and make the most impact is really knowing who you are, what you do, and being able to talk about that and describe that. So, um, you know, that really leads to an artist statement, really having a really strong artist statement. Um, I think that's paramount, you know, I think up, up, after your work. Obviously, you wouldn't be here if you didn't feel strongly about your body of work, that you weren't dedicated to that, and this is kind of the next level of after you've put in all the, and you think about it, all the time that you put in, all the techniques that you learned, all the money you spend on art supplies and um, studio space or whatever it is, you dedicate all that time to your work. You have to leave some time <laughs> and some money to carve out to promote yourself and put your work out there. Otherwise, it's just going to stay in your studio and you collect dust and it'll be so sad that nobody will see it. So, um, so yeah, the first thing I always recommend to people, before you even start to put it out there, you know, is really thinking about who you are and what you do. Because um, if you can really nail that down and hone in and find that voice, it's really going to help you go a long way to help your viewers understand your point of view, where you're coming from, what your work is about. So I'd say that's number one. Um, Number two, I think the thing that I hear a lot from artists is like, okay, if I want to sell my work, what kind of art do I have to make? 
And it's like, no. <laughs> you're not making work for a specific audience to sell. You're gonna make your work that is you. And then the second thing is finding your audience that loves your work. And I've seen it all. I mean, I work with artists. I call myself a creative business strategist because I like to stay, stay in the creative field. I don't like to get hung up on art or craft or fine art or any of the mediums, you know, and what is real art and what's not. It's all, it's all great. And there's an audience out there for you. I've seen so many people, um, you know, just once you really hone in on who you are, um, and put yourself out there, then your audience can find you. And you'll be surprised how collectors come or people just fall in love with your work and fall in love with you. And so um, a good case in that point was um, many years ago, shortly after I first moved to Portland, I met an artist. And before I was really coaching artists, he just kind of knew that I was in the art business and admin and was like, hey, can I pick your brain about this? And then he um, was showing work that was, um, well, he grew up in, uh, in East LA, and he was a graffiti artist. But then he became, he self-taught himself like classical training painting, and blow your mind detail realism. And he's like, so I do this for these people, and I, I want to find a place to do this for this, and I'm just like, what would be way more cooler is if you found a way to bring them together. And then it would really, when I look at you, I see both things. Like, he was always like, bagging pants, and then like the blazer, you know? And like, just had this like really unique style to them. I'm like, if you could start focusing your paintings where you go there, and he he has, and he's just kind of blown up now. It's really exciting for him to watch him. He just painted um, the Rose Festival Queen. I think it was in Portland. It was like the portrait for the the Rose Queen. I was like, that is so cool. Um, yeah, and I think that's the thing is you know so. I'm, I, I, I feel like I'm going on and on about this, but I just feel like these are the two things that are like so key, is knowing who you are and then let, and like letting yourself be known for who you are and you'll find that audience and don't water yourself down for, for anyone, you know. Um, and because the internet, the world is such a huge place, so um, when you find a niche, you know, somebody out there is looking for you, you specifically, you, what you're doing. Um, and so it's really exciting. I, even when I started doing my business, I remember when I started freelancing and thinking, well, I, I can do all these marketing things. I could do them for anyone, really. I would, that's not, I, what I really would love to do is work with artists or arts organizations, but who knows if I can get that. And I remember a friend saying, like, well, what is one-on-one? And I'm like, oh yeah, she's like, you know, like, focus on what you want. Um, and you have a concentration, and you become an expert in that area, and then people go to you for that. So that's kind of, it's the same rule applies to your art that does in any other marketing. So um, spend time doing that, I think, is really important. It's so important, in fact, I, I created an online course just devoted to that, because I really started feeling like the more people wanted me to work for them or do things for them, I'm like, you have to do all this work first before I can start designing things or building a website or whatever. Um, and all of, those foundational things then give you the language and everything to do the next part, um, which we will get into. So then I think, um, you know, there are several ways, again, depending on what type of work you have or what skill set you have as far as tech goes. Um, and you all have different goals, right? Considering who your audience is, whether you want to get into a gallery or you want to sell your work yourself online. Um, I think it's twofold too. I think you could start in a place where you do really well online for yourself, and then you're kind of proving yourself, and then you get interest in representation that's going to want to represent you. Um, or flip side is maybe you you're you're working with a gallery and you're getting attention and you're realizing that you want more control, you want more freedom, and that you're ready to kind of go out on your own. Um, and I've seen it go both, both ways as well. Um, but I thought that we, we've got the web, so it's a great visual. Um, so key points in, you know, we have the basic things that can help you. One, we all know social media, right? Huge thing, like, 
doesn't cost anything. Um, and social media is great, but I think the most important thing about social media um, is just consistency. So, um, and that can be a lot of work. It seems like a simple thing, and it can be a simple thing, but just the constant posting and um, finding time to, to create content and post it can be quite exhausting. So, um, while it, it's a great um, resource, and um, I'm pretty sure everybody already is aware of Instagram and things like that, um, I will say that it may be, and this is something you'll have to test out, but I know sometimes when you're posting content and content and content, it's kind of exhausting. An easier way to go is to spend a little money and take out ads on Instagram. And this way it's just kind of, you create a few different contents and you put it out there and then you drive traffic to your website where people can sign up and the people who are really interested will can keep tabs on you there. Um, sign up for your mailing list. Um, so I guess the website is something that we, is an important thing and we'll, we'll get to that because I think um, it's what's great about having your own website is it's, I think, really takes you to the next level professionally when you have your own website, when you have a website that is um, like a paid site, especially not just like at like a Wix free site that are, but just really has your name and, and then you can get a Wix site, you can get a Squarespace site for as cheap as $20 a month um, that's just basic and put it together. So I thought we'd look at some websites. Um, there's a artist, her name is Erin, um, and I showed it to Y. So and it, her website is oils, uh, by E, Y, wait, sorry, E, R, Y, yeah, dot com. Bear with me, I'm not here for the track ads. There's no worries. Great. So this is Erin's website. I think she's done a really, really great job uh, with her website. Um, I just want to kind of go through the anatomy of a website with good things that to look for when building a site. Um, and we have slow internet, so. <laughs> no worries. So one is that she has this thing that's like her collector's club. Join the collector's club that pops up and there's a mailing list. So I think having a mailing list on your website is really great because you want to capture people's information so you can communicate with them. Even if you don't communicate with them that often, you still have their information. So, I mean, it's great if you can put out an email or even a newsletter. We can get into some of that technology in a little bit. Um, probably already know some of you already. But, um, you know, if you send something out monthly, even quarterly, just capturing those emails, you never know, because a lot of times when people are buying art, or thinking about buying art, they fall in love with something, but it's not usually the moment they buy it, because maybe they saw it, caught their eye, don't have the money for it right now, they're saving up, or the occasion, or they like your style, but didn't find the right piece, and they're kind of waiting for the one. You know, maybe the one that they follow on their website is already purchased. And so they're just going to keep watching you and see what you're making. Or maybe a holiday comes up or something and they finally feel like that they get a big paycheck or a raise or something and they can finally splurge. So you just really want to be able to stay on their radar. So capturing their information is really important. So having something where they can, the pop-up is great because, I mean, sometimes they're annoying, but they work. <laughs> so they're effective. Um, also just having a place where you could just sign up on your website is really great. Um, we already talked a little bit, so there's the about section, you know, definitely on your about section, click on it because I think she's got a great one. Um, you, want, you want to tell a little bit about yourself, I think it's great to have pictures of yourself, pictures of you at work or working, that always looks great. Um, she does landscapes, so she's got her and nature and stuff, and it's just really, you really get a sense of who she is. And the thing is, because people, they're gonna fall in love with your art and buy stuff that they love. But they, it's also kind of falling in love with you <laughs> and the story. Um, and I think that's what's great about buying art. A lot of times it's a conversation piece. So, um, and there are so many times when if you are 
selling something face to face, you know, you get to put your personal money out. If you're selling at a festival, which maybe some of you have already done, so at your booth, you're able to connect with people. You want to have the same kind of feeling when people come to your website that they know you and not just your art. So. Um, yeah, tell, tell, she's just got a little bit of bio information here. I think it's great. Um, her fun facts are adorable. <laughs> her artist statements. Um, and all this would go right on, on her about page. Um, she's got a link to her Instagram. So a lot of websites do that too. It's called the RSS feed, where you can link your Instagram page or social media to your website. So this is just every time you post on social media, it goes on your website. Which is a great way to update the homepage of your website, um, and people then can follow you there, and, and, and that's great too. So, yeah, so that's Erin. Let's try, actually, can we go to alicechristinewalker.com? Sure. No rush. No worries, don't worry about it. I'll keep you up in a while when you get there. Walker.com. She's one of our members at Blackfish. So Alice, Alice is a member of Blackfish, so she has Blackfish represent her, but you know, she still has her own site. Um, and I think it's great because she does other things. Um, and she'll list her exhibitions that she's been in. Um, which if you've been in exhibitions before, it's great to have a place that shows your past exhibitions or series of works in that in that way. Also to have a CV, so just having a list of, um, it's like your artist resume, um, and having a list, and I think we can find her CV on here, we can get, uh, that's what I was getting at. Let's do her CV. And also she's got great photos, she's a photographer, um, she, so, she looked, so she lists her awards on here, residencies and things that she's done, and, all, and press, and that she's gotten in interviews and stuff, um, which is great. It's great to get publicity. Um, the difference, does anybody know what the difference between publicity and marketing is? Publicity is It is. It's true. So I think the main difference is my mom works in, in public relations. <laughs> she imparted this on me. It was like that, you know, marketing is what you say about yourself, and publicity is what other people say about you. And so it's a really powerful thing to get somebody to say something about you, whether it's in an article or a testimonial or whatever it is. And so it's, it's kind of, you know, you can, and it's important for you to market yourself and promote yourself and say great things about yourself. <laughs> Um, it's actually how other people find out and will like get mirrored back to you in the world. Um, but having other people talk about your work really like just takes it to a whole other level. That, um, but I find that even when I started out my business, I just decided one day that I was tired of working for other people and they would hire consultants that came in to give my boss the ideas that I. <laughs> I already had the very set. I'm like, I keep telling them these ideas, and then they don't believe me, and then they go and hire a consultant. And the like, well, did you try this? And then my boss is trying to tell me that shit. I'm like, I want to be that guy. And so just, you know, one day I just decided that that's who I was, that I was going to quit my job, that I was going to be a consultant, and no one said that except for me until I started working and people hiring me and people thought I did a good job and people recommended me. You know, people are like, oh, you know, person's all in the consultant. And so that's really exciting, you know, but it really starts with you deciding that you are this, you know, and it's, I think that's been the greatest aha moment of my life is not waiting for somebody to tell me who I am or what I do or that I'm good at it, that I have to have that confidence in myself and put it out there. Um, and I think there's a fine line between arrogance and confidence. You know, you can talk about yourself without having to feel like you're full of yourself. Or, um, you know, I think all of you have something, I'm sure, unique and special to offer. And if you can find that and express it, you know, it'll start to um, just start from there. It's always the littlest thing, too. And I think that also times I've heard people 
people where I give talks like this or people want to work with me and we talk about it and like, yeah, I know already all that. I'm like, okay, so why haven't you done it? <laughs> you know, and I think a lot of it is because even though you may all know this and it seems easy, it, the hardest thing is to just keep doing it. The hardest thing is to just keep going and keep building and accepting that you have to start somewhere and that you can allow yourself to be a beginner. Allow yourself to begin and just have a website, you know, and just keep getting better at it. Keep improving it, keep adding things to it. So even if you start with a site, okay, you don't, maybe you don't have this whole ex exhibition list or a big CV or whatever, but just start with what you have, you know, and start adding to it before you know it. All the things will just add up and they'll be there and that's how everybody gets there. So allow yourself to be a beginner and just start with what you have and don't feel like, oh, I don't have enough. Um, it's okay, I mean, you have your work and that's a great spot to begin. Um, which leads to the next thing, which obviously Alice's site is great because she already has photographs, so maybe Erin's site is a little bit better of a recommendation. But I can't stress this enough, especially my background is in photography, to have really great pictures of your work. And the good news is that you live in the Pacific Northwest and it is the best place to take photograph of art because the light is like always, it's always like a little cloudy in the sky. <laughs> when it's not raining, it's always sort of overcast or, overcast or cloudy and that actually gives you the perfect softbox look and makes everything even, the light is all even so you don't get any funky shadows or anything. So I photograph a lot of the work at the gallery and I literally just take it outside and put it on an easel and I shoot it with my camera on a really high res um, size. And then I crop it. And then sometimes I have to adjust it in Photoshop. There's this perspective warp tool that you can kind of just get the perspective, you know, the, like leaning or whatever, just to get it straight. Um, and it's a little tricky, I know it's a little advanced, but it's worth learning um, just for that reason because then if you can photograph your work well and really have it well lit, um, clear, crisp, high res, it goes such a long way. I mean, it probably still will not do your work justice as a person, we know that, but it gets people interested. At the, at the gallery, I've had so many people, we talked about this last, last week too, you know, do you sell work online? Oftentimes, if we don't sell it online, it, that's, it gets people's interest enough to come down to the gallery and want to look at it in person before they actually buy it. So if you've got great photos, um, it's you really want to showcase your work really, really well. I see so many websites that just don't have great photos or the um, it's just hard to see or it's too dark or it's fuzzy or it's pixelated and it's just really important. Um, it's worth hiring a professional to do it even too or, or learning the scale, getting the camera, figuring out, like I said, the light here is amazing. So if you have paintings or, or even sculpture, um, taking it outside, I highly recommend it, you know, even just on a uh, plank wall or whatever. Um, there's also, if you have smaller items, you can get soft boxes that, um, if you're interested in this, you can email me and I'll send you a link of, <laughs> of how to get it. But you basically, you know, you have a like jewelry or you have small items or small sculptures or whatever, you would just put it in the box and it has like soft box walls um, to soften the light and make it all even. And, 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 and to be honest, some of these apps are getting so amazing that they will take out shadows and crop things and stuff. I'm like fascinated. I started in Photoshop when it was Adobe 5.5. It was like the very first version much and have learned so much as, as the program has grown but now like in the app it's like I used to have a job I worked for an architectural illustration studio and my job was to photograph people that they would put in these renderings and it was hilarious actually we would hire people off Craigslist to be models <laughs> so people would fly it was really really funny it's hilarious we actually had a calendar made of like all these people because it was really really funny but then you know people would come in shoot them and then I have to crop everybody out and it was so tedious and now it's like absolutely like choo 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 and then background gone. So that helps too if you're if you're doing product, you know. Um, 
So, and, and so many of the websites have the ability for you to just list products. If we go back to the Oils by Erin site, that's exactly what she has. Um, you can purchase her products right online, which is great. Um, yeah, prints or shop paintings, either one, yeah. Yeah, so she's, she's got her work. I think she's photographed it really well. Does, again, her work in person is just like thick layers of paint. It's so intricate. It's, the photos won't do it justice, but I think she photographs her work really well. Um, and so, yeah, you can, you can just purchase things right online, which is really convenient. Um, if you don't have a website, or before, or while you're working on your website, you know, you can stick to the classic. You could work, put your work on Etsy. I'm sure you guys know about Etsy. They're, they're, they're changing a lot, I think. And I think part of it, too, is that there's more stiff competition with artists just doing so well that they don't really need Etsy anymore. And so they're, they're, they're getting more commercial stuff now. You know, they're getting more, it's kind of getting harder and harder to find real handmade stuff on Etsy. Um, but it's still a good resource, I think, if you don't have your own website and you just want to upload things. Um, I think for whatever you do, whether you're going to a shop like Etsy or um, having your own website, a big thing is keywording. So SEO is your search engine optimization. That's how people find you. And people find you because they're Googling, right? They're just Googling words painting, pastels, earrings, whatever they're, they're, they're Googling, they're going to find you because it's in your keywords. So websites will have this in the back end, a place where you can enter keywords. Um, Etsy has that where you can tag products with keywords so people are looking for it so they find you. Um, I think keywords is just something you have to sit and brainstorm about. You can ask other people about too what comes to mind when you think about your work. But in general, the more language you have on your website, the more keywords you're going to have on your website. The more pages you have, the more words you have, the more apps someone's going to be able to find you. So um, it, that's why it's great to learn how to talk about your work. <laughs> Because even if you talk about a body of work or a certain painting or things like that, that's all going to start adding words to your pages that Google's when they search, it's going to it's going to find you, um, help people find you. So um, that's all sort of organic traffic. Again, same thing with um, if you're on social media and you have Instagram keywording on Instagram, you know hashtags and um, just choosing ones that relate to your work, you know, um, I think oftentimes you'd be surprised how just consistently posting and using hashtags will start to build up your audience over time. I just think that in general, I always try to encourage people to and remind people that this is kind of a long game, you know, and it's really about, um, so I always quote from it's not FDR, although I saw it at the FDR Memorial, it's Eleanor Roosevelt talking about FDR. And there's a, and I don't, I can't, I'm terrible, this is one of my favorite quotes and I always butcher it. <laughs> the, the, the essence of it is when, I, when Eleanor was asked about what made FDR like so great, or his greatness, she basically said, um, infinite patience and never ending, never ending persistence. And I think that that's the key to all of this. It's just um, that I've seen so many really talented people start and do something, and then they just give up because they weren't like an overnight sensation. Or, you know, once you put yourself out there, you also are open to rejection, right? So you might get comments that you don't like, or I don't know. And you have to let that roll off your back and know that just one comment does not represent the whole world. You know, I think in general, rejection just kind of with part of the territory is being an artist and um, learning how to take constructive criticism. You know, I think if people are on the internet bashing you, like, block them, you know. <laughs> but I, I've seen artists, artists that I've worked with 
light. I have an artist that I worked with for many years, and I wanted to talk about her because I, the next thing I want to talk about is Patreon. Um, but she had all these followers, like thousands of followers, and she would still, in our coaching meetings, come up with like, this person said this thing to me. And I'm just like, why do you care? <laughs> you know, like, you have so many people that love your work and follow you and that support you, and you know, it's just like, you, at some point, you really have to just like um, find a way to just tune those people out and just realize they're not your audience. You're not going to be everybody's cup of tea. Not everyone's your cup of tea. Actually, someone wrote a really bad review about a book on it that she had on Amazon.com, and it was just like very clear that this person was just not your audience, you know, and and, and that just like that's okay. It's okay that they're not your audience um, and that they figure that out. Um, and actually, the way the review was written, I was like, you know, it kind of works in your favor. I think people will be reading this that are your audience and be like, yeah, she's, what is she talking about? You know, like, it seems so ridiculous. So, but um, one of the things that I wanted to share was Patreon. So we can go to uh, Patreon, P A, yep. Yes, that's it. Yes! You guys know about Patreon? Is there anything about Patreon yet? All good. I have to tell you, it's so exciting. Um, so Patreon, you know, back in the day when some of these, um, you know, public campaign funding uh, campaigns got going, we had Kickstarter was one of the first ones. And Kickstarter was under the premise that you had a project. And it was really focused for people who were like maybe making films or maybe making music, whether you put out an album, and they knew if they could get people to buy it in advance, then they'd have all the money to make, to produce it. And that if they couldn't get the money, then they probably shouldn't produce it. So, you know, since then we've had GoFundMe and all these other things, and I think Patreon brings back Kickstarter, but in a way that artists can really use it. And so with Kickstarter, there were these if you support it at certain levels, right, you get certain rewards. So Patreon takes that same model, but makes it ongoing. So and back in the day, many, many years ago, centuries ago, artists had patrons. That's how they survived, right? They had people who supported their work, that paid their way, that paid their bills, that gave them money, um, that helped them live. And so I love that the internet is bringing back this ancient practice of um, patronage and makes it super easy. And so you can create a page, um, and then you can set up different levels for different people. Um, and I wonder if I have to, we can go to the Wondersmith, if, I think it's slash Miss Wondersmith, or we can just Google her. She's the one that can help me set up. Wondersmith? Yes, widespread wonder. Yes, there we go. So she's got different levels. So when, when I met the Wondersmith, she um, was an artist, glass artist, doing a residency at Your Bros Glass when I go with my clients for, and my job was marketing, and so I was you know, taking photos and promoting her residency and totally fell in love with her work and what she was doing. And um, she works in all sorts of mediums, but everything that she does is like recreating things in nature. And then she told me, well, what her most favorite thing to do is throw surprise parties for strangers in the middle of nowhere. So she leaves, she leaves invitations out, and then she makes all the dinnerware, and she forages all the things, and makes all these crazy recipes and meals, and then she throws a surprise party for strangers. And she's like, well, I don't know how to make money off of that. And I was like, oh, I think I do. <laughs> Which is how Patreon came about, because um, I told her, I think you're like Banksy or like Andy Goldsworthy, where people would just love to support you and know that that exists, and so you can keep doing it, even if they don't get to go to a party at all. So, so what she does is you can support her at different levels, and she shares recipes, um, and she has like a craft club that she shares like like actual like tutorials on how to do stuff for certain levels, and she's done where she now. And even at the lowest level, that's $5,091 a month that she put brings in now. And that is um, only at like $10 on support, and she has supporters all over again. So, I mean, that's pretty crazy. You know, she went from thinking, how the heck do 
do I even monetize this to pulling in that much money a month? Um, she also has a chronic illness, so that was something that when, when she came to me working around, like she can't always do all those parties all the time, and that's why they're surprised. And I'm like, yeah, it's great. I don't think people are gonna, you know, so finding a way, I, I, I say this to encourage you all, that, that I feel like there's a way for everybody, you know, it's so interesting um, that then there's an audience for you, you know, and so she's found all these people around the world that just, um, or love her work, and she she would create a mandala every month. That um, now Patreon has a way that you, they actually have hooked into like print services, so they'll fulfill uh, rewards for you, where they'll do prints or stickers or whatever, which is which is great for the low level things. Because at some point she had these care packages of things that she made for the higher ones, and it was like a shipping and packing and all this stuff, and she was like, I, I can't keep up with this every month, especially as more people started like signing up. She was like, this is just not working, and I'm like, that's okay, we can always change the plan. So, but she's, she's so, yeah, they, they do quarterly posters now at that certain level, and they ship it and everything for you. So that's a great way, too, if you photograph your work really well, to have something for patrons um, to do. And you could come up with anything. I mean, a lot of times the $5 or $10 level is just like, hey, thanks for your support and being here, and that you kind of get. The other thing that she does, which was kind of a workaround for, again, she didn't really want to sell her work. She didn't really want to keep up with it. Some stuff was really precious to her, and she just didn't want to sell it. And um, But then also she's always testing recipes, and she's got all the stuff that she makes. And I was like, Okay, so just save it all for when you do feel well enough, and then you have a sale, and because you never really sell things that often, people are going to be excited, and she sells out every time now. And so what she does for her patrons is she gives them 24-hour access first to whatever she's selling on Etsy. She'll just say, hey, you get a 24-hour heads up, and usually by before she makes it public, it's all sold out. And so they love that that they get kind of first dibs and that's really part of like just that basic level. Um, and it really has worked really well for her. And it, again, this is something that's taken like six years to grow into this, but she's just been working at it little by little. And, and, and now it's gone to a certain point, right, where it's scalable and it can just grow and she's still doing the same amount of work and it just is getting bigger and bigger and that's really exciting. So I love Patreon, I think it's great. I've been um, trying to think of more ways that we could use it at the gallery um, for our artists too. Um, and let's see. Yes, go for it. I just where it says like fulfilled by Patreon. Does that mean you said that Patreon sends, says it on her behalf? Yeah. So now they have, they worked it into their system where they, you know, you upload whatever the image is and they'll print it on it and they'll send it to your, it, and you set it, like, okay, at this level, at $25 a month, they get a poster quarterly, and then they take care of it. So. Yeah, for sure. And so, like, you know, all this stuff is like, this is great, and then they take a percentage, but, I mean, it's worth it if you can build it up, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, well, and feel free to ask questions any time, you know, and I think actually I'm going to wrap up in just a bit so we have time. We're going 7.30, was it? Okay, but we we'll can leave some time for questions, too. Um, I'm going to look at my list of things that I wanted to talk about. Patreon was a big one. Um, oh, this is important. So I think overall, too, what is really important is just brand consistency. So using the same, and simple, using the same font, you know, sticking to a few colors that you feel, and that's the hardest thing for me. This is why my like, card is like, my new card is a painting <laughs> that I purchased that um, I try to deal with the artist. I'm like, I just want some things super colorful because I can't decide and choose colors. And my other, um, the, the course, I just stuck with like CMYK because I'm like, that's the basis for all other colors. So um, sometimes it's hard when you're super eclectic and it's hard to choose something. Maybe you already have a certain aesthetic or style or something that you're drawn to. And it doesn't mean you can't ever change it, but I think sticking to something for a while and being consistent with um, the font, not using too many colors, you know, that's how you recognize a brand. 
instantly, you know, is that you you know it, you know, think about all the brands in your life that you know, just from the label, from far away, you wouldn't even, you would just, it would just stand out to you. Um, so having the graphics, having the color and the font all consistent around, I have a client right now who, we can go to his website actually, he's trying, I've been up, <laughs> he's great, and he's trying, and we're working together on it. Um, and he's the first, he'll be the first person to tell you, like, I need to work on this, but let's go to, um, his name is Cameron, K-A-M-E-R-O-N, Mesmer, M-E-S-S-E-R.com. He's really, really fun and cool. He's a balloon artist. He grew up in a magic shop, and um, he can, like, do all these sideshow things and stuff, but he's really good at twisting balloons, and he creates all these balloon installations. So, let's see, Mes oh, sorry, Mesmer, there's a, there's a M, Mesmer, yeah, yeah. So he, so what he, um, he started with uh, this one idea that he was gonna create a balloon installation that could be kind of like a, a selfie thing. Um, and, oh yeah, it's getting better, okay. <laughs> So if you scroll down, so these colors are like what we decided upon. We created a logo for him, and that's the logo. Um, are this blue and pink and white, and, and keeping that consistent. But throughout his whole website, it's like if we go through the pages, you'll see it's like whatever goes with font or color or whatever. And so I've been getting on him about changing his site so. It reflects, um, oh, see, it's getting better. <laughs> He's listening, my eyes, it's so good. Yeah, I, that pink is, I don't know, it's like a red. But the, it was like orange before and green and like all this busyness and going on and random photos, places and stuff. And I was just like, you have so much great stuff here. It's I'm just, just see if I can find some. yeah, so I keep looking. But maybe this is just a testament of, people who take my advice and are doing good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it, before he really had like so much going on and busyness and colors, it was almost like, it's just hard to read, you know, and kind of things all over the place. And so we worked together to create some branding around what he was doing. And he also had like five different names for everything. He was like the Daredevil Wizard, and then he was this, and Balloon Art, and I'm like, and he had like, he still has like five websites, and I, they all just pointing out of this one. So I'm like, just keep it simple, you know? Keep one thing. Because what happens is, is people get confused. Is that you? Did you change? Are you still doing the same thing, you know? So again, this is like about infinite patience and never-ending persistence. So it's, a, it's part of it is just consistency over time builds trust in a brand with you and your brand. Um, so many times I've heard, so I'm on the board of the Portland Art Dealer Association. And so I've been on these panels with my colleagues that are um, gallery owners, and I hear them say a lot, one of the things that they're looking for in artists is just consistency and knowing that they're gonna keep making work because what happens is that they'll get work, it'll sell really well, and undoubtedly like a collector will be like, oh, I wanna buy another, what's, what's new? And it's like they just don't have anything else or they just stopped. And so they're really looking for people that over time, so you never know who's watching you that is interested in your work. Maybe they're not ready, or they don't feel like you're ready yet to represent you, but they um, really want to, yeah, he did this awesome thing in the mall where he uh, rented the old gap and created a whole like installation. He's got a thing right now that is in downtown Portland that's called the Joy Store. It's just a donation-based thing, and then you go in, and um, just get joy. <laughs> and there's all sorts of balloon installations and stuff. He's renting uh, an old like uh, investment firm building that has like 10 offices and gonna fill them all with different things with, with different artists too. So, and, and it's, it's exciting when, um, when you start to build up this brand and how, and that's the thing with Cameron is that he's gotten all this great press and it's come from people going to his website and just posting things on social media. And he'd be the first to tell you that he's terrible at social media, he hates doing it, he rarely does it. But I think that, um, you know, just having a presence and just beginning is the one little thing you never know what's gonna lead to the, to the next thing and just keep 
building on it. So he moved here uh, right before the pandemic, and so his work was really doing events, and they all stopped. So he had to like generate his own thing to really to get it going. And in just a short amount of time, it's really um, starting to take off. So it's exciting. And oh, so the other thing, so the other thing is that you can, if you're not a graphic designer, I think. Do you all know about Canva? Because this is another thing that's super awesome. Let's go to canva.com. Love Canva. A coworker had told me about this after I um, I come from a graphic design background and I know what InDesign and Illustrator and all these programs. And she was like, we just use Canva. And I'm like, what's that? And then I was like, oh man, people are getting really good. So this is a free resource that is incredible what this what this does for design. So you can do social media posts. Uh, they'll, they actually give you the layout where you just pop in all your information. Um, exactly, if you want to design for say an Instagram post and you want something that's just that size. Um, this, is, this tool is amazing. Um, and then you can download it as a JPEG. They do have templates that do cost things, but they have a lot of free ones. But a lot of the templates that do cost money, they're not that much money, so you, you fall in love with the template. Um, and the other great thing is that this is a great way to find a place to just pick your colors, pick your, you know, pick a template even that works for you, um, and just start creating content that's consistent and that makes it easier for you. So I'm trying to think of another, if, and then you can make flyers on here, you can make you know, square JPEGs for posts. Um, you can make brochures. It just seems like it has everything that you could want. Posters, presentations, logos. You can even design a logo. Um, infographics, your resume, it's endless. Yes. Do you have a, um, a site for making your website? Yes, let's do that. Let's look at, uh, we can go to Squarespace and we can go to Wix too. which I think both Squarespace and Wix, it's so funny how they're all trying to like be this one service spot now. So some of them do have, like I think Wix does, where it'll, it can make your logo for you as well, which is great. So I love Squarespace. It's, I, I use it personally for my website. It's $20 a month. Um, and it's got great templates. If you don't look, look so, and you'll just, you can just pick a template. I get annoyed that a 
attempt at home, do what I wanted to do, and then I try to hack the system. But I'm not really that tech savvy. Um, more just a designer. And when I really what drew me to working on websites was just the design, and that I wanted to look the way I wanted to look. And I'm picky about it. And so Squarespace was the first website I ever worked at, and um, that really let you have control, the most control, over moving things around, um, where you want to place things. Otherwise, you're just kind of stuck. I use it for um, the Portland Art Dealers Association website and my own personal site. Um, Wix is another one. You can go to Wix. Wix.com. Yes. So you mentioned high-res images. Do you really want? I mean. Not on your not on your website. That's a great question. That brings up a good point. So and a lot of some of these templates will have a feature where you can um, lock your images where people can drag and drop them or save them, which is great. Um, that's a great point. You when you shoot your work, you want to have high res images because you may want to make prints from them. You may get um, somebody who's interested in your work. Um, that wants a high-res image. I know that when we sell, I just, one of our members sold a piece to um, the University of New Mexico, and they wanted a high-res image of it, and they have a piece. <laughs> so I was like, good thing we have it, because we do, because we took it. Um, so, but yeah, if I want something that you want, and this is like, put on your website for two reasons. One, you don't want something to steal it, and then just print it. Um, uh, the other one is that it will slow your website down. So it just takes a long time to load all those images. So you'll you'll want to make two different versions, a lower res version, um, not too low where it's pixelated, um, but enough to see the quality of the image. Do you recommend um, putting watermarks on the images you put on the web? You know, it's tricky because it depends. I mean, I think it's distracting from your actual work. And I think it kind of degrades it. I get why you'd want to do it because you're nervous about somebody stealing it. But I think if it's low enough res, or if you have a feature where you can lock the images where they can't be taken off, um, yeah, there will. A lot of these websites will have a. <laughs> they have a lot of these websites have features where, like, so it won't get they won't get stolen. And I have to be on the back end to really <laughs> find it. So it's like, but um, I mean, and this is what like I have a, I have a friend who's an IT person for like a really big company, and I was just like, she's like, whenever I get to be honest, I just Google almost everything. <laughs> and so that's what I would say is like if you're working on it, and you can't find it in the back end, just Google it. Literally, like how do I lock my images so people can't steal them on the internet? If I was on the back end, I could probably find it. It's one of those things now you kind of do without even thinking about it. It's like autopilot for me. But if you email me, I will find out the answer of what it's actually called, and I will let you know. Well, yes? So is that why um, the oil by Erin, uh -huh. she kind of details, I guess, that's what that was, under the mm -hmm. image, uh -huh. so that rather than you know, scroll, I guess I assume someone would just look at something closer, but that you can have a higher res, higher res detail. You can, yes. That's another way to get around it, where it's a higher res detail where people can see that, especially with her paintings, because it's really hard to tell in a photograph, like the level of detail and the thickness of paint, and how she like piles it on. Um, yeah, those are all great questions. I wish I remembered exactly what it's called. <laughs> But I will, I will, if you email me, I will, I will tell you, I'll look it up with the back end, I'll tell you, yes. I'm wondering about domain names, like this is uh, Oils by Erin, and I know some people just use like their first and their last name. Yeah. And then to go along with that, like there's .com and there's like .art, um, do you have advice about that? Sure. I think, it, I think it's kind of fun because like it used to be like you could only be .com and that's what was professional, and I think that's changing. But my own website, um, I, for arts and cultural management, I use .com because I feel like it's more professional as management. But with Think With Your Heart, I use .io because .io is, an, is a new one on the scene and it's really like techy. A lot of um, web developers will use it for their websites or new tech or apps will use .io. And Think With Your Heart was already taken 
Calm, and I didn't want it to feel like calm, like commerce, like businessy. It's really supposed to be like an online course. So I wanted to have a different feel. So I think it really depends on your vibe, you know, what your business is, what your brand is. Really, that's what it comes down to. What is your brand? Is your brand more, um, you feel like more, want to come off more like commercial based? Because um, I think dot art or .NET feels a little bit like the cheap end. <laughs> dot .NET feels a little like, um, I don't know, like the imposter brand cereal. But I, I, that is, maybe that's just me. I don't think it's a bad thing either. I haven't seen anybody that was like, oh, no, .NET. I think the biggest thing is like get a domain name that you own and use a real domain name and not have like, you know, whatever, Chris and Solomon, Squarespace, dot, like it's totally free and it just is. It doesn't cost that much. Usually it's about 10 to 20 dollars. I guess it depends on what you pick. Um, I think sometimes too, I have ChristianSolomon.com for a while, but people spell my name wrong all the time. And so that that's hard when people don't know how to spell your name. I think that's why Aaron does Aaron by oils, because first names are a little tricky spell and then last name's tricky. So um, it's up to you if you want to be your brand and be one of the, the wondersmith, what we were talking about building her brand, she was very much like, I really like the Wondersmith being like this fairy tale character that does this thing and I really want to separate it from me and my own personality and my work. Not that her name is a secret, but just that that's what the brand was. It wasn't about her, it was really about, more about being anonymous. So I think it's really up to you about, you know, what you think works for you. But I also think when it comes to email, it's, it's the same thing. You know, having an email address that's really clear. I don't think Gmail's too bad as long as it's like very clear. It's not a whole bunch of random numbers or things. It's I have personlsolomon.com at gmail.com is one of my, my emails. But I think what really got my game professionally was spending the five money on a month <laughs> to just get it at my domain name domain name. It seems it's like it's one again, little small I think it costs money, but you know, I, and I said this in the last um, workshop, and I'll say it again because it's advice that was given to me, and I think it's great. And then it's like, um, you know, a coach, a business coach, to me said, Well, if you don't, I said to her, I, you know, I'm looking at working with artists, and I know the first thing I'm going to say, I don't have any money, you know. And what do I say to that? And she just said, Well, you know, if you don't have $500 to spend a month, um, on your business, and you don't have a business, you have a hobby. And that really struck me, because it's true. There's tons of artists out there that are just hobbyists. That are just, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with doing art as a hobby. It's great. But if you want to sell your work, if you want to you know, brand yourself, put yourself out there and be you know, a professional artist, then you have to think of yourself as a business note owner, as an entrepreneur, and that you're going to have to invest a little bit, especially if you want people to invest in you. And so, whether that's buying your work or representing your work or whatever it is, and I think there's these little things, a $20 website, a $10 domain name, a $6 professional email address that you can actually, what's great is, so Google has, I love Google, I think everybody uses Google, and what they've made it really easy is that you can get a Google, um, use Google to run your email at your domain name. So I have chat at thinkwithyourproduct.io, but it's still all connected to the Google system, so it's great. So I, it's like I don't have to learn or log into a different place, um, but I can still have it represented as my business. Something I just have. So yeah. So art would be yes. I think so. I mean, yes. Yeah. I think so. If it's your name, not art. I think that's great. You know, I mean, I think, like I said, people used to be much more of a stickler about it. I also think artists can get away with way more than other businesses can. You know, so if you as an artist have your name, not art, I think that would be fine. I think. Um, you know, it's clear that it's you and your art. Nice. You know, I think some people have done, like, I did a website for, uh, it was 
LindaBlueArts.com, you know, we did it that way. But a lot of times it's tricky if your name has already been taken, you know, and then you have to try and get creative. So sometimes having dot art is just the way to do it, you know. So I, I think that I wouldn't snub you for it. <laughs> So that's why I want to, while we have, we'll have another half an hour left, to turn it over to um, questions, discussion. Yes. We just have a question. What your thoughts are on, on platforms like Art in America or Saatchi? Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. I get calls from them all the time for the gallery to join them. I think another thing, it's one of those things where it's a lot of work to build and then you're kind of just lost in your system unless you really do good keywording and all that. Um, I feel like it's probably, and then they take a percentage, and then the thing that I've noticed with the gallery in negotiations, they're like, people can return things, and then that's on you. And if they, if you sh and then you have to ship it, so the shipping's on you. And it gets quite complicated. So, I feel like if you're going to do all that, you might as well just do it, uh, have your own business and it. And that gets into the question though too, is there's a lot of scammers out there that when you do start doing this stuff, we were just talking about this other day, there's just this classic scam of somebody from another country wanting to do wire transfer, so be on the lookout for that, you know. Most people, you hear that and you're just like run, you know, like, we'll send you a bank, a banker's check or something like that. Like it's um, all those uh, kind of scammy things. You know, I see people get scammed before because they're excited that someone wants to buy their art and they go through the process of of all that. You know, um, I don't think it's a bad. I don't think it's a bad thing. I just I always think of things as like, what is the cost? Um, benefit analysis. So really thinking like for the time that I'm putting in to load up all the stuff onto their site, what are they really going to do for me to promote it? You know, when you could be building your own site and they're going to take a cut, you know, and yeah, they seem to be kind of gobbling up more and even working with the galleries and I don't know, we're a cooperative gallery and I'm a very part-time employee and so I've told those companies like, I, I just don't have time to sit and load it. I have to load everything into my site, <laughs> load it into your site. And you put in all that work in, and who knows who's going to see it? I mean, I guess you could drive people there, but you could just as easily drive people to your own website. And I also think there's a certain level of professionalism when you when you do it when you're on your own site. And I guess it also comes back down to your audience, right? Who's your audience and who you're trying to sell to? So I think a lot of times without that, it's like you could sell to anybody in the world, but then you've got to ship to anybody in the world. And depending on what your work is, it can be very pricey. And I just looking at those contracts, I think is the most important thing because, yeah. So on the key page, you said it was targeting your audience. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the various techniques for aside from keywords? ways of advertising or promoting or getting or finding that select audience? Of. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think one is thinking about when you know who your audience is, what do they want from you? Because all of sales, we always think about who we are and what we have and what we're selling. And there's like this, I've got this, I'm putting out there. Instead of most sales, think about who the buyer is and what they need and what their wants are and basically offering that to them. So it's a little bit of a reason versus saying like, I've got these great paintings, want to buy them? It's like, hey, you've got this empty space in your house and you need art, I've got it, you know? Like, Thinking about them, so you have to think, who is that? You know, is it, it depending on what your work is, right? So if you have very large 
you know, um, paintings that are, you think would be a good fit for interior design, go after interior designers. You know, start a, a, a list of interior designers in the area, reach out to them, tell them, you know, do you, and just say, do you have clients that have space and I have this great work that works? A lot of interior designers are looking for large-scale paintings, you know, that are more abstract, the colors are um, maybe more subdued. I don't know, there's just a range of things. So that, that's just like one point. And like, once you find out your audience, okay, my audience is really getting into big, bigger homes or, okay, so I want, who, who works with these people? Interior designers, who else? Uh, realtors, well maybe these people are staging homes and they can use some of your paintings to stage homes, maybe they'll rent them, maybe they will um, sell them and you'll, they'll get a cut, I don't know. But they're, you, you really have to know again who you are and what you're doing and what um, who your audience is before you can think through all those things. We could go on all day for all of you about what that could be, you know. Um, but I think that's the key point is, okay, well, what do they need? Where are they at? Where are they shopping? You know, who are they? Who, who, who are they using that you can? Because you could leave cards, right? With and with real estate agents or with interior designers, you know, just going along that same theme. Um, so it's really a matter of. I mean, that's kind of what my job is is helping people. I think that's what it comes down to. Whether uh, is working with people one on one and helping them figure that out. You're helping you figure out who you are and who your audience is. Okay, how do we find these people and how do we um, connect with them? Because really, ultimately, you want to make a connection. So, so much of the basic, you know, and you may have heard this term, marketing is the five P's. Um, and it is people, so who's your audience? Um, place, you know, where you're, uh, where you're placing your things, where you're placing your ads, where you're placing your cards, um, where you're placing yourself. Maybe going to a certain, getting a booth at a certain fair is like that's where your audience is, and you know, like it was like Aaron. So Aaron and I um, were working together. We do a retreat. We backburned it until the end of the summer because she knows her busiest time is just festivals, and she does them and she does booth and she does really well with them. You know, and a lot of times, this is not an exact this is this is science. I shouldn't say it's not an exact science. It is science. That's what science is, right? You have a hypothesis about who may like your work, maybe what they're looking for, and then you test it out. It's an experiment. You try this thing, you try that thing until really something bites, until things stick. And so you may, you may try several things. You may just try several audiences. It's hard to get specific until you know who you are. And so I think that's the thing is like people, that's a natural question that people ask is like, well, how do I promote this or that? Or what do I do it? It's kind of like, I can't even answer that question for you until I know who you are, and then we can kind of go from there. And that's why I started working with people one-on-one, -on -one, or even built the class that I did to help people figure out how to do that for themselves. Because um, it's just a key point. Otherwise, you're just kind of shouting into the void, right? It's really hard to, because ultimately it's all about making that connection, making that connection. Um, and I think, thinking back to why and my favorite thing is about art, is that most art, even if it's just decorative, has a certain element of self-expression. And the most beautiful thing, the most powerful thing about art is that we are able to express our humanity and other people can relate and there's a certain sense of, you know, like storytelling or whatever it is, we're drawn to it because there's humanity there and we all want to feel connected. So I think finding that thing about your work, putting it out there, um, and, th and thinking about who you want to connect with is really what's going to um, make that connection. And I think that, um, so I think it was a recently, um, this woman named Tatiana, she was born in Ukraine. Um, she's based in Portland. Um, she's part of Portland Studios. I um, met her before um, several times, and we, she actually reached out to me to possibly work together. And one of the things that we talked about um, was her work. She does paintings of post Soviet life, you know. And um, she's like, I just don't know who the audience is for this work, you know. 
And um, and we talked a lot about it, you know. And she, as she was telling me the story of the people in her paintings, and she was telling me about this, but I didn't see that on her website. I didn't really hear about that, you know. Um, and so I encouraged her to keep doing that. Um, I mean, now you get to this point where Ukraine is in the news every day, and people are very interested in her work because there's this touch of humanity and wanting to connect with the Ukrainian people. So, I mean, and your work doesn't have to be about war torn, you know, villages or anything like that to make a connection, but just as a very overt example of how um, telling your story, sharing about where you're from, thinking about who you are, and getting really um, down to it, um, you never know who you'll connect with. And I think that's the thing that people are out looking in the world and something, I just look at, the work that I'm seeing around me in, in this room, and um, and I am clearly like a certain narrative or voice is coming through, you know. And so I don't know if that really answers the question. I mean, you get into more ideas about promotion and stuff, um, but I think you know the basics are having a cons consistent presence first, and knowing yourself and setting up a consistent presence. Because whatever you do to put yourself out there, whether you're handing out cards, or whether you are just talking to somebody at on an airplane that you ran into, that you blow, you're an artist, so interesting, tell me about your work. You know, there almost everybody now in the world just Googles and go, <laughs> or just goes, wants your website, and that's what's gonna verify you. You know, and that ultimately is going, and how that, um, how consistent that is, how informative that is, is going to be a game changer for you. And I've seen it happen to artists over and over again, who just like, didn't really have much to start, but they just started there, and that worked wonders for them, just um, the, the night and day of like having that professionalism, just changing the course of their career, or people are interested in that. Because there's something about, even if somebody's interested in your work, they may, you know, there are collectors out there, I mean, we're talking about collectors being your audience. There's a sense of wanting to invest in you and to know that, like, a lot of times, like, oh, you're a rising star, um, knowing that you've, um, you're really serious about what you're doing. Yes? So, um, for those who might want to get prints made, I know there are so many websites out there. Yes. I know, it starts to get overwhelming. And you know, there there is that, that you could go to like Society Six and have like your, you know, little shop that makes leggings and bags and notebooks and all the things and it gets overwhelming. I think the thing about it is to do tests, you know, and test and see and what the quality is. So I used Printful before, I was really impressed with what they do. So we go printful.com, that's another great resource. So if you want to make prints of your work and have them available on your site to sell, um, I have done this with clients before, and I thought they did a really good job. I have a client that does pastels, and we she sells her work. There's a certain way on Printful that you can set it up on the back end with Squarespace, where you don't even know it's Printful. It's just like, it's doing all the work for you. Where people go to your site, they see the image, they click on it, to a checkout card, but then it's linked to Printful, and Printful is fulfilling the orders on demand for you. So, and I think the quality is pretty good, but I think it's good to test it for yourself, for your own work, and um, see if you like the paper, if you like the quality, if, you, if the colors are right. I was pretty impressed with the color matching. I have been um, like an ambassador, I feel like, this point, they should be a <laughs> There's a place in Milwaukee called Bear Printing, and they do, um, they really do real estate cars. Truly, that's what they do. That's Alice Walker, uh, who's one of our gallery members, turned me on to them because uh, she used to work in real estate, and so she knows, like, they're cheap printing, they print out postcards, and we, a lot of the people get their postcards. Um, Blackfish made there, and I saw a postcard, and I was, and I, I, Comparing it to the actual photograph that was in the postcard, I was couldn't believe how the color match came out and the weight of it was great. And then I was expecting it to be like, okay, whatever it is going to cost, 
is fine because they do a good job and then it was actually one of the most affordable um, places and they ship um, so even though they're, they're not too I mean Milwaukee is still kind of far from here but it's um, it's kind of far from where I'm in part of Portland but I'm willing to drive the 30 minutes out to go get it because they do a good job but they do ship too um, and they're local and um, yeah it's like we some of the people in the gallery have made prints of their work there too. We're kind of like, let's try them out, see how they do with prints. And I've been really impressed with what they do. Uh, there's a place called Symbiosis Printing that does actual G clays. So if you really want kind of that really high end um, copy with, um, you know, they, uh, they'll do the G clay printing for you of your works, which would be more expensive, but then you can sell it for more. Yes. Okay. I'm familiar with Jaclays from back in the 90s when they first started out. And I'm with a group now that they are saying they want to do Jaclays and sell them at a show. But they're just using the term spreading of ink. Uh -huh. What is your terminology for what a real Jaclay is versus a print off of a, a regular printer? I mean, I think it's the printing. I think you're right. I mean, at the end of the day, it is the spreading of ink process I think the way and I, and I know less about the process so I'll just be upfront about that but I will say that the, the difference between going to bare printing and getting a laser printer or an inject printer and then getting a G clay where they're actually um, use like high resolution archival inks and, and I'm sure they'll tell you more about the process on their website um, but I know many of the artists um, at Blackfish have used in these printing for their chickens. And that's local? Portland. They're in Portland, yeah. I think in Mullen Village. What is that? What? Capital Highway. Oh, yeah. 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 And so people highly recommend them. Um, and I've seen them. Going through the piece. Oh, yeah, sorry, thank you. I have a touch of ADHD, and sometimes I get squirrel mind, and thank you for bringing me back. Thanks. Okay, so we talked about people, we talked about placement, um, price. So, this is something we should talk about, right? Pricing your work. Everybody wants to know how much should I charge for my work. Um, and I hate to break the news that there's no set standard. I know people think that there is, or they might say there is, and you can see these things going around. Like, price per square foot, which sometimes people do, but I think the better way to price your work is to do that and think about how much money do I need to make? <laughs> like, for myself, for a living, how much money do I want to have a year? How much expenses, how much how much does my material cost, right? Because it's a lot. And then you take that number and you try to estimate your time and then double it because it's always going to be more than that and then see where that gets you. And then you kind of think about it in the marketplace too. Like what, like what will the market bear ultimately? And that's the real answer. Nobody likes that answer because it's not a straight out answer. But again, this is one of those things that it's really got to be unique to you, you know? Um, and I think that's why there's also this idea of like making prints, you know, because then if it's something that you could sell from your website and you want to capture an audience that is looking to just buy a print for anywhere from $20 to $200 um, instead of your painting. Or, or you know, it happens a lot too. Uh, this is why I tell people in Blackfish, I could have sold that painting 10 times. And if you made a print of it, I bet we could sell, like, like painting is gone, but you took that high-res file, right? Before you're working, you took the high-res file they were. Now you can make a print, you can make a G play of it or whatever, and you can sell that over and over and over again. So there's something that's super popular. I, I felt bad one time I actually bought a painting and um, it was a pastel work, and it was in hanging the office and we could always leave work a few pieces from the past show in the office. And I had people coming in, Because I want, but it's like it's really funny how it's like you, I could have sold it ten times, you know, 
over and over again. Do you find there is a market for prints? Absolutely. The question is, is it your market? Because there's an audience for everything. So, but you don't have to have that. You you can be that artist that's like, yeah, I don't do prints on my work. I just do original. I'm not going to focus on that. And that is fine. You can also be an artist that just does prints, and that's all you do, and you just design something. Where, again, it comes back to who you are and what you do, and really fun that. I, I don't think you should do prints because you just think that's the best way to sell your work, and that's what you're going to do. I think that if you want to connect with that audience, you, you can. I think the other thing is that, you know, again, if you're looking to, you know, if you're looking to just sell your work, um, you're just excited about what you do and you want to put it out there. If you're looking, and then there's the next that, and then there's the I want to be in a museum one day. Well, then you're probably not going to be focused on prints if you're setting your sights and goals higher. And if your audience is a museum, if your audience is a really high-end gallery, then prints are probably the way you're going to go. But if you are just looking to expand, make your work more affordable, I mean, Barbara Black, she was the Black and Blackfish. She, we just had a, a opening with, uh, she has a small show in our back room, and she was saying how she likes to price her work really low because she wants her friends to buy it. And that's what it comes down to. It's like, that's why she prices that. She's probably worth way more than that. She's far black. And <laughs> she's 86, she's been doing it forever, you know. But she prices it that way because that's what she wants to charge because she, her audience is her friends and she wants it to be affordable. And even though she's the name in the gallery, like, that's what she does. So it's really, again, yeah, it's like, I know it's like, being the same thing. But it's like you can't, you, that's why you have to make those decisions first. Who you are and where you want to go and who your audience is. Because then everything else will dictate that. Because they're so, it's such a huge, large world and it's expanded even more with um, the internet and you can sell your work all over the globe and people do. And there's a big good Instagram. Um, look at uh, Aaron Stewart. I think it's just a, yeah, Aaron, because she's great. She's posting, she's got a little studio, she's making work all day long on these giant paintings. She's selling them to people in California, she's shipping them all over. She doesn't make prints of the world, you know, she does, she's on that trajectory, but she's doing it all through Instagram. I don't even think she has a website at this point. Okay. A-R-E-M-Y. Stewart. There, that's Aaron Hunt. There you go. That's her. I think she does a great job on her Instagram. Um, well, she does a website. See, I don't even go to her website because her Instagram is so good. And she sells things. Um, she's constantly posting stories of works in progress and showing people. I think if you're going for that, where you're less focused on um, your really, then you want to be really focused on the process. That's another way to promote yourself. Um, is, you know, she does lots of shots of her in the studio and hanging things or painting things or if she's in the middle of working on a painting or if she's still wondering if it needs a touch of more. She'll, she'll, she, you just kind of have this inside track to her world. And she really is just a stay-at-home mom in her studio in Portland and she's selling things all over the country. And it's exciting. But I think, you know, she has consistently, she's, she's constantly posting. She definitely has, um, a distinct style to her work so she can capture that audience. And yeah, she's already up to 4,000 followers. That's not bad for what she's been doing. Um, yeah? You said you think her Instagram's really great. Instagram's like a template already. So what about it? It's uh -huh. great to you. Like, I think just what she's her content and what she's posting. Right. So I think that, like, so she, um, you know, she takes these fun photos of herself with her work. You kind of get a sneak peek into what she's doing. Um, she names all our pieces, like fun, quirky things. I think that's great. Um, the piece that I bought at first that's on the back of my cart is called Everything's Gonna Be Okay. And that's why I bought it, because it felt like it was the pandemic, and it was so hopeful and brightly colored. And I said to her, if I could put it in my office and feel that way every day and make other people feel that way, that it would be great. Um, so I just think that she, um, yeah, she really, Dallas is a whole process. She's posting stories and, and telling, giving people kind of the inside track to her life. So she's not just 
posting static pictures of pain. She's showing them the scale of them, right? So she's showing them in their studio, or she's showing them in places where they um, people have bought them and then hung them in their homes. So that's another great thing too, is just to kind of show the scale. Because sometimes that can be hard in a, in a photo. So we, we said people, place, price. <laughs> That's three piece so far. Um, and product. Product. Yeah, that's an easy one. What you're selling. <laughs> know what you're selling. Promotion. And promotion. Thank you. <laughs> it's good. You're like a senior now. I love it. You look so good. Um, yeah. And so, so it's okay. So we went with. People, who you're selling to, product, what you're selling, price, what you're selling it for, placement, where you're putting it out there and selling it, and then how, how you're promoting. So the promotion, not just, so again, if you don't want to sell like a used car salesman, you know, like, but there are things that you can do to promote your work. That, you know, on Instagram, I've seen people do giveaways, or they do a raffle thing, where, hey, tag a friend, and they will all be on this thing, it's a great way to keep get building followers and stuff, um, promotional things like that. Or I've seen people say, like, hey, it's my 30th birthday, everybody's getting 30% off today, you know? Um, and and there's also cross-promotion, right? So if you are showing off other people's work, and then they'll, they'll show off your work and work together, or if you're in a show with somebody else, um, then you can cross-promote and um, promote each other. And I think that's another great way. I know with Lundersmith, that was the way that she built her audience was, um, you know, doing an Instagram takeover on somebody else's site, or that she took over their site and started posting her things and built up their audience. Were like, hey, follow me. So if you find somebody in your community that maybe is doing something like you're doing, or maybe um, you know, just getting out there and networking with other artists, and, and you could do something like that, or maybe this is something that the Salem Arts Association could do which would be a great way to help the community here get followers is maybe they have an Instagram to go over and then you all, maybe, <laughs> um, could do that. Where you're getting to, that's a great cross-promotional thing, right? Using a resource like the Salem Arts Association to say, hey, we're going to do a takeover and uh, an artist in the area tell you about stuff and hey, follow, follow me now on my channel to, to keep up with me. And then maybe you get a week or you get a day or something. And it would be really fun. Is it okay to just reach out to people and DM them and say, I love your work? Can we do something like this? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think that, you know, I think as long as you're polite about it and not demanding, then it's fine. I love your work. I want to connect with it. I want to do this thing. Do you want to be aware of it? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, that's exactly how those things happen. Okay. You know, it's, it's just from putting yourself out there. The worst thing they can do is just leave you cold or just ignore you or yeah you know I think if you go and you know I don't know I think anything goes in that sense of why it's so exciting to you never know who you can connect with you never know who is on the other side that's saying yes to you you know I find when um like on LinkedIn I got approached by somebody who was just like hey I'd love to just chat with you and do an informational interview and find out more about like and I was flattered, you know, I talked to this person and then it like made me remember them and they were graduating and wanting to go to Portland and I was like, well, what do you want to do? And if I get you connected with an internship, you just never know. So I think, again, there's so many trolls out on the internet and people putting themselves out there feeling rejected <laughs> or feeling like no one is responding that maybe you sending them that DM, like admiring them so much is like the thing that just made their day and they're like, great, you know? And I think alignment is another thing about that. You know, like really finding people that align with what you're doing. So if you guys have a similar audience or, you know, sometimes still a similar product is hard because it feels like it's too, but something that maybe isn't the same, but it complements really well. Um, so like the Wondersmith, when she was working with foragers, like they weren't other artists, although she worked with other artists too, but they were foragers, and it's like kind of getting that foraging part of the audience. So I think it really helps to do um, this exercise called a mind map. 
um, I would suggest when you're thinking about your audience. And it's really just like you are in the center and then just literally mapping out, doing circles around you, like who is in my immediate community? Whether that be the Single Arts Association, whether it be another artist that's in this room, whether it be me, hey, Kristen Solomon, or it's Cultural Management, Blackfish, whatever. Like, we are, who's right in your immediate circle? And then who are they connected to? You know, and you start to really start to have this visual representation of who is all around you. Because sometimes just the easiest thing to just get started, right, is that first point in contact. And I moved here from New York 10 years ago, and I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody in the arts, especially. I mean, I had a connection through my old job with Bullseye Glasgow, and I really wanted a job there, and I thought I was going to get one, and it didn't work out. But um, then I'm here in the city, and I just decided, okay, we'll just start with the obvious thing, and um, what's around, what are the resources? found out about RAC and the Regional Arts Council. Okay, what are they up to? Well, it was right around the time they were doing the State of the Arts report. I'm like, okay, cool, I'm gonna go to that. Because it's, anybody can show up, and I'll just show up and hear what's going on in the arts. And the person sitting next to me, I, I became really good friends with. She's like, she calls me an important daughter, you know? And she was an executive director of this organization called Colored Pencils. I started volunteering. And I can't tell you how, like, just a little thing like that, to like, I'm standing here in front of you giving this talk, you know, like, where you, you just have to begin and just start with where you're at and making the connections right next to you and you never know where, it's kind of that six degrees of Kevin Bacon where it could lead to, you know, um, and foster those relationships and foster those things. I think it's, it's really helpful. I think a lot of times when you have a goal, especially you have a big goal and it seems so far out there, you know, you try to make a big leap and you, and you don't get there and you just give up when it's really, it's more of like this matter of small steps and just taking that first step and just taking the next one and having that patience, persistence to keep going um, and, and to get to the next rung. There's a really great meme that I saw that was like, like uh, two ladders next to each other and there's like all these like short little rungs and then there's ones with, like all oh, these guys are like, trying to like reach up to the rung and the other guys like, you know, he's scaling to the top because he's willing to take all the small things. And I think that's what I find most from artists that are stuck or not getting anywhere is they're just not willing to do the small, tedious work, the little parts. I mean, it really, it turns out to, if you're, if, let's get back to that like interior design thing, right? If that is like your audience going and call, not as a cold calling, but sending people DMs, stopping by the studios, dropping off your things, that's a lot of work, you know? And it might not yield a whole lot right away. It may just take some time to build up. It may take to, like, they have that one client that they, like, remember you. Oh, yeah. But you're still on their radar because you just keep, you know, sending communications. I and mean, that's something we didn't touch on was um, MailChimp. We could go and do that real quick. If oh, we're at or we at time, we should. Okay. <laughs> I was gonna say MailChimp is a, is that's another thing you guys can look into is a um, great email system where you can people can sign up for your email, you can track them, it's a database, and then you can send out things. I can do this all night. <laughs> I really feel um, I hope it was really helpful to you. I hope you